So hi everyone. We're doing iconic settings. Uh, obviously the hashtags Monstrous May Challenge and this stuff that I run is Romancing the Gothic, so feel free to tag that in if you like. Um, so today we're going to be talking about gothic settings and I thought we'd start off making it interactive um, with a, oh I felt like such a cool teacher then. Um, we're going to do, I'm going to ask you a question and you can respond. So my basic question is, what are some classic Gothic settings that you know and or enjoy? So just shout them out, because I can't see you. Be brave. Castles. Yay. Big house. Mm -hmm. I like the shouting out energy that you Decaying both Decaying manor voices. homes. Ooh, yes, manor homes. The deep forest. If you the moors? In the chat, I can read them out. Sorry. The moors, yeah. Thank you, Yaris. Nunneries. Sorry? Nunneries. Mm hmm Yes. I said you. woods. Woods, nice. All classics. Okay, you've got some of my favorites. Yeah. Um, I thought I would put up some, uh, some inspiration. Uh, basically, I was thinking, I'm only gonna go through some Gothic settings today. Some of them that are disparate, I'm gonna group together. Some of them I'm going to look at separately, but I thought I'd put up some kind of uh, inspirations here. So when we think of Gothic settings, we might think of more general settings, such as I've got the woods, graveyard, the moors. Uh, I've also got the sea, or the coast, um, a carnival, for example, so particular locations. Um, and then I've also put inspiration up from specific films as kind of ideas of these spaces. So I've got the, the castle slash house from Crimson Peak, uh, Rebecca um, and the, the hall there. Um, I can't remember what it's called. What's it called, guys? Mandalay, there we go. Um, the urban landscapes of Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, uh, the hotel from The Shining, obviously there, um, Ellen Ripley's spaceship, and the kind of pastel gothic of and there were none. So we're going to be looking at these kind of general groups. We'll be looking at sort of thinking about particular examples. And hopefully, as you can see here, I won't be kind of confining it to one particular traditional conception of the gothic, but we'll be moving through different types of setting. So <clears throat> I'm going to start, what I'm going to do basically is give a history of gothic settings. Now, I'm not saying that they definitely went from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and then castles were at the beginning and they're now forgotten. Obviously not, but I'm going to be mapping some trends. Um, but beyond that, I'm going to be thinking about the why of these being popular gothic settings. Um, we're going to be looking at sort of the aesthetic why, so the features of these settings that lend themselves to the gothic, but we're also going to be thinking about the content of them, the, the meanings encoded in them, and the ways in, in which they reflect particular historical context, potentially. Now, having said this, um, it's worth noting, obviously, that each different setting, castle, manor house, carnival, the sea, um, will have different meanings um, dependent on the subject position of the person writing it. So who you are writing will inflect how that setting is used. So if you are a servant, you're going to be writing about castles in a very different way than a king. Um, and it's also going to be inflected by time period. So we're going to be talking about the 18th century and the way that castles were used, but those debates and understandings about castles, the way in which castles were used to reevaluate the civil war is not a context that exists anymore in the 21st century. So those contexts and ideas change. And we also have obviously now today, we have a history of these settings that have garnered and gathered meanings over time, more and more, more meanings. <clears throat> so that's sort of worth bearing in mind. And I'm gonna be using some examples of how uh, spaces have changed meaning over time. Um, and then the other thing that I'm wanting people to sort of think about, and we'll come back to at the end, is this idea of whether when we're engaging with these settings, we're engaging with tropes and or reimaginings. And if we're engaging with tropes, are these tropes that have become purely aesthetic, i.e. just, you know, we like castles because they are they're dark and creepy, um, or are these uh, tropes that still come kind of with this inherited meaning, these inherited baggages? And... Uh, sometimes we might be unconscious of that baggage. Sometimes that baggage might not exist anymore, but um, it's worth sort of evaluating, I think, when we're using these settings, how we're using them, what we're doing with them. And so that's something to think about. So I'm going to start us off at the beginning, 1764. Everyone knows I always start here with the castle of Otranto, but really more broadly, the castle. 
So when we're looking at the early Gothic, um, the castles were sort of key to a lot of those novels. So I've got some examples here, The Castle of Otranto from 1764, Mysteries of Udolpho from 1794. And then we've also got, you know, into the 19th century, the castle recurs in novels like uh, Dracula by Bram Stoker. There are various sort of features which lend itself to the Gothic. So these ideas of the labyrinthine passages, broken and porous entry points into the castle. Either there's a secret entrance from underneath or there's a hole at the wall. Uh, there's these ideas of dungeons and entrapment of locked doors and secrets, and also this edge of ruin that's often attended these castles, even though historically they wouldn't have been in ruins at the time. What you'll often find in these Gothic novels um, are that they are a reflection of the British landscape of the 18th century, not the historical landscape of Spain or France or Italy, wherever they are actually set. Um, now, there are various meanings encoded within the castle. Um, uh, so. Often these castles are places of fear and terror, um, and they stand sort of encoding these ideas about feudal power, about aristocratic dominance. And they're often also connected to uh, sort of worries and fears about church state relations and the proximity of the church and state. So we see that quite often, we see it in the castle of Otranto where we have a monastery and a castle adjoining each other. And that's a really common trait actually. So these castles as places of terror, a representation of the terror felt by the sort of bourgeois and middle-class writers for these particular systems of, um, of governance, of absolute monarchical power, for example. So the context that we're seeing this in is the rising middle-class consciousness, which you're getting in the 18th century. Um, and we're also getting the 18th and early 19th century reassessment of the civil war, the civil war that happened in the 1640s in England, which is what led to the landscape as it existed in the 18th century. That is a number of castle ruins, um, basically. So by using these settings, it becomes a reflection and part of the debate on the civil war and this kind of sense of societal fear of unrest um, that fear of unrest was tied to the 18th century Jacobite uprisings in the first half of the century. And then when you're coming to the end of the century, you've got the revolutions in America, in Corsica and in France. And you have this British almost conservatism, this um, uh, in relation to that because of this inherited fear of the destruction of the, of the civil war. So castles become actually quite a conflicted space. There are lots of meanings that can be encoded in them. So some little bonus features about the castles is, as I've already said, these often occur in foreign landscapes. Um, we have a really good talk on the Transylvanian Gothic and the way in which the representation of Transylvania and Dracula's castle has nothing to do with Transylvania or Transylvanian literature um, of the period or Transylvanian, Transylvanian self-image or even the understandings of Transylvania uh, by actual sort of travelers or business people. But foreign landscapes became a way for Britain to exp British writers and Irish writers as well to express their fears, um, express their concerns, but on a safely distanced model. Uh, they would throw it back in time. Often the early Gothic novels were set historically and they would put it in another land, um, which they would code as barbarous, as superstitious, often as Catholic which they would uh, categorize as other, pretending that it wasn't us at all, but it was. Um, we've also got uh, sort of inflecting this obsession with the castle, the reevaluation of the medieval, which happened in the 18th century, uh, the rise of antiquarianism. So the reevaluation of the medieval is the move from thinking of it just as this barbarous, dark, forgotten era, um, and this kind of uh, reevaluation of things like chivalry from the Richard Hurd letters on chivalry. Um, and the reevaluation of its architecture, of its um, culture, uh, the practices of antiquarianism. Um, and this was all sort of tied in together with creating a sense of British identity in the period as well. Um, and we can see all of these things tying together in the home of somebody like Horace Walpole, the writer of Castle of Otranto, who built his own sort of mini Gothic castle there at Strawberry Hill. Okay, another popular setting in those early Gothics is the monastery and or the Inquisition. Now I've, I've put them together even though they do function slightly differently because they're both sort of commentaries on these Catholic institutions. So um, some key texts that you might enjoy. Uh, the abbess is um, set in a nunnery with a lascivious abbess. 
Um, the Monk, St. Leon by William Godwin has an inquisition scene and Melmoth the Wanderer has a really extended monastery torture and a quite an extended uh, inquisition sequence. So the features of these settings are sort of uh, the metaphor, the, the, not the physical level, uh, they're hypocritical institutions and that is reflected in their ar ar architecture, things like trap doors and hidden ways. There's also in these spaces a juxtaposition of barbarity and opulence, both at the sort of visual level. So you have the, the dungeons and the, as you see in the picture here, these cold stone walls and then the opulence of uh, the gold plating and the, uh, the actual monastery itself, for example. Um, you, you also find sort of a key emphasis in these ideas of the Inquisition being underground. There's a darkness and obscurity. There's an emphasis on claustrophobia. And in many of the depictions of the monastery, there's an emphasis on isolation. Oh, it's just about to take off, I guess. I'll just keep talking. Hopefully you can hear me. <clears throat> so the meanings <laughs> of what you get from this um, what kind of meanings are encoded into the depiction of the monastery and the Inquisition? So the easy answer would be a form of anti-Catholicism. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, it would be a form of anti-Catholicism. I wasn't laughing at the anti-Catholicism, I was laughing at my computer. Um, but it's not really enough to say anti-Catholicism. What does that actually mean in this context? Um, we also find writers very overtly or covertly using these as a critique of the persecuting state, i.e. a critique of uh, interwoven state and church relationships. Um, and we're finding it also as a critique more broadly of monasticism, but also of isolationism. Um, and the context for this, which makes sense of why it would be a critique of a persecuting state. Well, you're seeing um, uh, a number of things happening at this period, most importantly, the French Revolution. Now that lends to anti-Catholicism. The French Revolution was uh, largely atheist in origin, and you saw a rise in anti-clericalism there and the production, widespread production of anti-clerical pornography, which produced these ideas of nunn nunneries, monasteries, etc., as these places of sin, darkness, devious deeds. Um, but what you're also finding at the time of the French Revolution um, is a crackdown in England. So you'll, you have the toleration debates about religious toleration that are occurring throughout the late 18th century. And in the 1790s, these come to a stop because there is a sudden crackdown on dissent, Christian dissent, in the wake of the revolution because Christian dissent is tied to radicalism. And so you have legal crackdowns on the ability to, uh, to function. You have the removal of the habeas corpus. Uh, you have the show trials of various people. So you have this repressive relationship between the Anglican church and the British state. Um, and sort of critiques of that are encoded within these depictions of the monasteries and the inquisition. Um, and why do I say it's not just about anti-Catholicism? Well, the Inquisition didn't really exist to a great extent at that time. Yes, it continued up into the 1830s, but not as a major symbol of power. So this is sort of a fear that's not a fear of Catholicism itself. Um, it's a fear of state church relationships. Bonus features related to the monastery and Inquisition is that nunneries particularly often act as places of refuge. And here we see a gendered point of view um, now, sometimes it's a monastery, as in the Orphan of the Rhine, but in most novels like The Children of the Abbey, The Italian, Mysteries of Udolfo, lots of different ones, it, the nunnery is a place of refuge from male persecution or a potential place of refuge from male persecution. <clears throat> we also have the ruin uh, as a location, a popular location in the 18th century. Uh, for example, the Romance of the Forest. The features are, these are ruined spaces. Uh, tying into conceptions of the sublime at the time about the sublimity of ruined majesty. Um, there are also places that are porous and vulnerable. They act as a sort of temporary refuge, but prove to still be dangerous because they're riddled with secret rooms and passages that lead to secrets to be discovered. So these ruined spaces are representations of decay. They become representations of the decay of power, of church, of family, um, of particular families within the novel. So the abbey that you see there that Adeline is in is actually the ruined property of her uh, forebear, of her father. And so the ruin become is a representation of the ruin of the family. Um, and they also become a, a, a place or a point of meditation on the temporal nature of all power. 
We also have uh, the particular context in which these accounts of ruins were being written. Debates about ruins and obsession with ruins was a major part of the 18th century. You have the depiction, uh, production of all of those follies at country houses, you know, these fake ruins. Um, what we're having at the time is the popularity of the discourse of the sublime produces a way in which to admire ruins uh, because ruins are sublime. Um, it's also part of a reassessment in the period going on on the dissolution of the monasteries. So Henry VIII, during the Reformation, when he uh, instituted the Anglican Church, dissolved the monasteries and basically sacked them, took all of their money, and the, a lot of the buildings were destroyed. By the 18th century, there was a sense of the sort of uh, the horror of what had been done, in effect, was this destruction of culture and history for profit and greed. So in these ruined spaces, we often have some anti-Catholic sentiment, but we also have these mediations and reassessments of the dissolution of the monastery. Okay, next place that was, uh, we're starting to see it uh, in the late 18th and then really the early 19th century as a setting is the asylum. Sorry, my computer's going off again. Um, so uh, some examples of that. The first example is Maria or the Wrongs of Women, um, who is very, very clear about this as a location that she talks about other Gothic novels and how they pretend to be horrifying, but the real horror is the asylum. Mm, off it goes. And particularly um, the position of women and the ways in which they can be placed in an asylum, the whim of their husband. Um, you also have asylums in Melmoth the Wanderer, uh, then later in the 19th century, The Woman in White, uh, The Moth by writers like Catherine Cookson. And then we read it this uh, last week, so The Price of Meat by K.J. Charles. So the asylum is a setting which has continued to be popular, although it is definitely one where meanings have changed. So the features of the asylum tend to be cramped spaces, maddening soundscapes, poor physical conditions, obscurity and cruelty, or a sort of clinical dis. Uh, disassociation as well. Um, and multiple meanings can be encoded in these places. They're often linked to exploitation and entrapment, hypocrisy and torture. Now in the late 18th century, this was connected to women, women's rights and position in the writing of somebody like Mary Wollstonecraft. And we see it again in something like The Woman in White or even The Moth by Catherine Cookson, that these depictions of asylums are tied to the ways in which women could be placed, inconvenient women could be placed in asylums for a range of ridiculous charges essentially. Um, including reading too many books, that sort of thing. Um, but they were places that were used to control uh, women uh, to a certain extent. We also see them um, becoming, particularly in the 20th and 21st century, we see reflections on the asylum uh, that include the idea that these were used as places, uh, part of oppressive structures on, based on class, gender and sexuality and race. So that these were places which were used um, to uh, put away uh, those that were discarded or unwanted by society. Um, now, the asylum is a slightly problematic setting, quite obviously. Um, you have some reassessment. So in The Price of Meat by K.J. Charles, you have the idea of the monstrous treatment of the mentally ill in the 19th century. Um, and you get that to some extent in some of these earlier books, but that's really not their main consideration. Instead, what you often get is the spectacle of insanity, which is also what we're getting in this artwork here. And by insanity, I'm using it as a very broad term as it was understood at the time. This idea that the body's behaviors and uh, sort of horrifying circumstances of people in these asylums were part of a spectacle to be seen gawped at and responded to, um, that you also get this sort of, the spectacle of insanity is also about uh, sort of exploring that space of fear, that space of um, fear of your own potential to sink into insanity. But these are not connected to any realistic, meaningful or empathetic depictions of mental illness. Um, so the context that we're finding, particularly in those early ones, was early feminism, as I've already mentioned, and coverture particularly, which was the law that you basically belonged to your husband. He could do what he wanted with you after marriage. Um, you, you ceased to legally exist in law because you became a part of him. Um, you've also got, you know, the, the historical asylums, places like Bedlam, which became tourist attractions uh, while they were asylums, while they were uh, mental health institutions. 
you're also in the Victorian novels getting these ideas of the Victorian advancements in psychology, which are coming and filtering into things like the woman in white or the moth. Um, and I've put the advancements in inverted commas because in some cases they were, in some cases they weren't, but you have the changing role of the asylum. Um, and of course, in more modern novels, we would hope to find reevaluations of the treatment of the mentally ill. Okay, moving on in time, we're actually moving across the ocean now because the wilderness, a broad concept, is key to the American Gothic. Um, and you've got a couple of examples here. You've also got it in the Australian Gothic. So this one here um, is a modern film, Bone Tomahawk from 2015. This is The Picnic at Hanging Rock, an Australian film. Uh, this is The Thing, obviously, by John Carpenter. And this is a music video which reimagines uh, uh, re Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown. But in all of these, you have wilderness spaces. Um, now, instead of the sort of claustrophobia and darkness of many of the Gothic novels, what's really to be feared here are these open spaces, these light spaces, and the sort of threat of the unknown. Um, so some texts that we can look at to uh, sort of explore this idea of the wilderness, the woods uh, we've got here in, Char in, um, in, Frank uh, in, Frank uh, in Young Goodman Brown. Uh, Edgar Huntley by Charles Brogdon Brown, an American writer. You've got Frankenstein and the Arctic Expedition, Young Goodman Brown and the, the forest at the edge of civilization, at the edge of the woods. Picnic at Hanging Rock is an Australian one where some sort of Western settlers get lost in the, the landscape. Uh, the Thing and Bone Tomahawk. The features of them will differ. Um, and you'll find that there are different national traditions as well. And there are a number of meanings encoded, but a lot of those meanings are incredibly problematic. So um, the fear of the unknown, the porous boundary between the civilized and the wild. Now that obviously you can see even from the language that I'm using there um, is going to be tied, particularly if you're looking at those early American works, um, but also as we discussed recently, the thing and sort of Arctic imperialism, but it's often uh, connected to a colonial imperative the self-defined civilized man confronting himself with the wild space that he cannot control. It's connected to the inherent danger of the uncivilized and the landscape and the people are tied together often in these things. You see that in Bone Tomahawk, which is an incredibly uh, problematic film um, in the way in which it sort of uh, depicts indigenous people groups. Um, so. It's also depicted from a very Western stance, from a very masculine stance, from a very colonial stance, as these wilderness places being the field to play out and test masculinity, humanity, endurance, etc. And the context that we need to understand this idea of the wilderness is inherently threatening is uh, colonial history is what provides that narrative for us. Um, now, a sort of opposite to this, or not quite an opposite, but a flip side to this, is writing from within those other spaces. And this is what we see with the wily, windy moors quite often, of the writers like the Brontes or Robert Murray Gilchrist, both of whom lived in Yorkshire, lived on the moors. So we have the moors as this wild space, often a wilderness space, but we have a more conflicted relationship with them. So the features are they're wild, they're open, they're bleak, they're muted. Um, they're dangerous, they're often wet because it's often raining, but you get these uh, contrary meanings encoded within them. So if you think about Wuthering Heights, you have these moors as both freedom and confinement. You have these spaces as dangerous to those who don't understand them, but you also have these spaces as operating outside the dictates of society in ways which are appreciated by the protagonists or writers of the novel. So in this case, in a number of sort of Yorkshire writers and Northern writers, you have them writing back to the othering of their spaces. And you'll also find that, of course, you'll find the, the sort of colonialist Gothic trope of the wilderness, often colonial trope of the wilderness, being rewritten uh, frequently. Um, so there's, there's various contexts to sort of why, where we're getting this idea from the Moors from, but you've got to think about it in terms of restrictive social conditions and this ungoverned space becomes a representation of rebellion against those restrictive social conditions. You've also got to put it um, in the uh, context of the internal divides within Britain in this case, between the North-South divide um, and the othering of the North as barbaric and wild or as Cornwall as barbaric and wild or Wales as barbaric and wild, etc. And Scotland as barbaric and wild. 
Um, and you'll find that people writing from within those places write differently about these locations. So almost at the end, guys, um, in the 19th century, we see a really prominent move. Oh, computer, why? We see a, a, a sort of overall move from othered locations, so foreign locations often, um, or these othered locations within the United Kingdom, um, so often they were set in Scotland or Wales, early Gothic novels, for example, we see a return to um, the, the city and to the home. So in the 19th century, we begin to explore not the dangers of out there, but the dangers of in here. So we have the dark and dangerous back streets, the urban landscape and the landscape of urban decay. And you can find this in a lot of Dickens works. It's even there in A Christmas Carol, kind of most famously in books like Jekyll and Hyde or The Beetle. Um, and in modern books as well, which are often rewriting back to the Victorian period, uh, such as the Rag Nymph or Fingersmith, you have these uh, dark twisted streets, uh, these urban decaying landscapes with um, overcrowding darkness and sort of the, the pollution, decay, etc., that is part of the urban landscapes of the 19th century. Um, so during the 19th century, obviously, the meanings that are encoded here are some of the threats of the urban landscape, um, explorations of the underworld of the city, and frequently an emphasis on social inequalities. By the time you're getting writers like Catherine Cookson and Sarah Waters, there is a keener eye often on social inequalities and how these played out from a historical perspective. Um, the context of the 19th century text is obviously the rapid urbanization that you're finding in Britain, particularly in the 19th century, the conditions of the working class and the conditions of squalor and the city underworlds and uh, sort of inadequate uh, provision, social provision leads to um, uh, an underclass who are essentially completely disenfranchised and a lot of Gothic novels will touch on their lives. Um, as I said, we're also coming inside to the house and we're coming inside to the house in a number of different ways, but you're getting the big old house quite frequently in, in novels like Jane Eyre, The Canterville Ghost, The Turn of the Screw, and the 20th century, uh, the kind of response to Jane Eyre, Rebecca, and uh, the Gothic romances such as The Mistress of Melon, and then in uh, the 2008 Little Stranger by Sarah Waters, a much more kind of clash conscious and historically conscious reevaluation of the country house. Um, but here in these spaces, you get the threatened or the poorest space again. Yeah, You've always got your secret stairs or your um, area that you didn't know was there, the door that you can't shut. Um, there's usually a mix of the old and the new, um, becoming itself sort of an, an allegorical representation of sort of the, the family, the society, the class system to which the house belongs. Um, the houses are usually expansive, they're representative of wealth and power, they're confusing labyrinthine, it's lots of glass and mirrors at the sort of level of aesthetics. In terms of meaning, what we have is this conception of the threat of the domestic space, and that's what we're finding as well in haunted houses. Um, we're finding is usually these ideas of haunted pasts and haunted histories. Now in the text, they're usually within family, but that becomes sort of a microcosm of society with these haunted histories of class, of wealth. Where did that money come from? Um, they become the place to explore ideas of class and inequality. And we see that straight away in Jane Eyre, for example. And we see it from a historical perspective in something like The Little Stranger. We also have explorations and fantasies of social mobility, particularly in the Gothic romance tradition that arises from Jane Eyre. The context in which these houses became sort of central to the Gothic were the changing social conditions of the 19th century. Um, part of that, and we see this particularly in The Canterville Ghost, was the fall, uh, was the sort of transformation of the country house into something that was becoming a symbol of wealth for industrialists and for those with new money. Um, in the 19th in the 20th century, we see the fall of the great house with inheritance taxes. Um, and that sort of becomes an increasing part of later depictions. Um, but we're also seeing sort of um, in the sort of the dream house idea, these houses that are in, belonging to a class above you to which you can attain by marrying into them, uh, you're seeing the rise of popular women's fiction. So there's a lot of class issues encoded in these big houses that are worth sort of interrogating if you're writing them. Now into the 20th century, we're keeping moving inward. 
And uh, there's a lot of concentration on the urban and the suburban space which came to the fore. I don't know if you recognize the films that these are from, but this is Rosemary's Baby. This is Candyman and this is Scream. Um, and we have, you know, different aesthetics depending on the, uh, the film itself, obviously, but also on the space. And this is often along racial lines or along class lines. So like the house, they have this uh, encoding of the threat of the domestic and the safe space more broadly, particularly when we're finding sort of suburban spaces being threatened. We have this idea of the suburban fear of the urban threat. Uh, which is often obviously again racialized. Um, we have the incursion of the other, um, an emphasis on social and racial inequalities can appear as it potentially was attempting to do in Candyman. We have motifs of urban decay. We also have potentially the banality of horror in the suburbs and uh, you can find in texts like Rosemary's Baby or perhaps in the Scream series, this idea of the dark side of the capitalist American dream. Um, the, what is uh, under the surface of these perfect suburban lives or these perfect modern urban lives. Um, and the context more broadly is the 20th century development of the American city. So I've taken this on a little whistle stop tour of some key settings and some changes in settings and changes in meaning. But when we're using these iconic Gothic settings, we obviously need to be thinking about what we're doing with them, whether we're performing a homage, a reimagining, a rewriting or a pastiche. I would say that Hammer films become essentially a pastiche. It becomes simply an aesthetic, a joining together of features which aren't encoded with meanings particularly. The Hatching, which is a crocodile film set in Somerset, amazing, um, becomes a sort of rewriting of the space itself of Somerset, but also a rewriting of those tropes and placing of the, um, the sort of the crocodile feature out of the wilderness uh, model of the Gothic and horror into the domestic, which is a really fun move, I think. Um, you also get the homage of something like Crimson Peak, which is a sort of knowing nod to a lot of both the visual and tr plot traditions of the Gothic. Um, and the house itself is, I mean, it's beautifully constructed. I'm sure we could talk about that for hours. You also get sort of reimaginings, reimaginings of the space and reimaginings of the Gothic. Now, I really loved the there, then there were none adaptation by the BBC because it managed to keep a very Gothic feel to the house, keeping a lot of the same aesthetics of uh, confinement, for example, entrapment, but putting it within a pastel frame, which uh, reflected the era in a really interesting way. So anyway, guys, that's a little run through of iconic settings. And what we're going to do in the next part of the session is we're going to be doing a little bit of writing and experimenting with these settings for ourselves. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And then if you have any questions, you can ask me.